Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well and, and keeping safe. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the resumption of the NOFC uh, 50th anniversary event, Reflections from Retirees, linking the past to the present. Uh, after a break over the summer where many of you were away, uh, we are continuing the monthly series. Uh, today, our topic is fire research at Northern Forestry Center, the early years. And that includes Bob Newstead, Dennis Contilio, and and Murray Maffey, and will be moderated by Peter Ingerfield. So thank you all for the retirees for, and uh, Peter for putting this on. And I also like to thank uh, Shara, Dennis, Dennis Quintillo's daughter who helped us uh, with the technical aspects when the slide deck together and some logistics for Dennis to be able to show this. So that's, uh, that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Shara. So uh, I see that everyone who are not speakers are, are muted, so thank you. So with that, I'm going to pass the reins over to Peter. You could take it away. Okay, thanks, Ron, and hi, everyone. Um, it's, uh, very, I'm very, very happy to see our three presenters here. Um, and I, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce them. I'm going to introduce all three of them at once because uh, they have a somewhat of a tag team presentation, uh, which um, makes my job as moderator very easy. All I have to do is uh, let them at it. Um, so our presenters are Dennis Quintilio. He um, started working for the CFS in 1967 before the Northern Forestry Center opened. So he was at the Calgary office and he was a fire researcher with us until he left and abandoned us to work for the province of Alberta in 1979. Uh, our second presenter is Bob Newstead who um, I joined the CFS in 1972 as a fire research officer. He also became the leader of the fire project uh, until 1983. Uh, after that, he worked in communications and technology transfer and, in, and was the regional coordinator for the model forest program. He left CFS in 2002. And, and then thirdly, we have Murray Maffey who uh, joined the fire program in 1976 as a field and lab technician. And he retired in 1996. So I welcome the three of you and thank you in advance for your presentation. And I'd like to pass the reins on to Dennis. Thank you, Peter. Well, there were two projects running at the time I joined the CFS one and fire behavior, one in fire suppression, both being managed by uh, Dave Keel. So I'll talk about uh, those, my own studies uh, as we go through here individually and they'll be in the order of this slide. Uh, the first three were, were uh, focused on fire behavior, the lodgepole pine slash in Kananaskis, Aspen stands at Slave Lake and then Jack Pines at uh, Darwin Lake. And then uh, as we moved into some client driven fire suppression projects, I started doing some initial attack uh, simulation and basic production rate measurements. And then a big one, the development of the aerial ignition system, which really started right in the basement there uh, at the Northern. I'll start at the University of Montana just because Joe Griggle, Dennis Dubé and I attended the U of M at the same time. And that's where we met Dave Keel in 65, 66, and he suggested applying for a summer student position with CFS. I'd already been working a couple summers in the far north in the bugs with the Alberta Forest Service. So this sounded interesting and I really appreciated Dave's uh, offer. Uh, I worked for Les Safranek the first month in May in Edgewater. Dave wasn't set up in Hinton that early and, and then moved over to, uh, to Hinton and worked uh, with Dave's group in, in 1966 for the rest of the summer. And I met Rob Reed, who was a good friend many years later, rode a lot of horses with him in the mountains uh, at Edgewater. He, he and Les were working on mountain pine beetle and we were logging large old infected pine trees and skinning the bark off and measuring the J-tubes. Uh, that's when Les was uh, just starting his illustrious career in re re mountain pine beetle research. I applied for a permanent position and, and joined Dave and Gary in Hinton under the fire 
behavior project. And then later in the summer, went over and worked with Joe Griegel and Reevy and Edson on their fire suppression project. And there's the group. Uh, we've listed uh, the group with Rob Reed as the manager, uh, the program manager, and, and Dave, as I indicated, the manager for the projects in, in fire. I must say that Dave was uh, really a good mentor and a great leader at that time. And uh, I think he encouraged us to work as a team, which I think we did great. And, and there we are, there's the team that Bob dug that up in his old files. And between the two of us, we think we have the name spelled right and everybody on board there, but uh, Gary did a lot of those and nice to see that, uh, that brings back a lot of, a lot of memories. I found an old picture in my files of Rob Reed on his retirement day there at lunch. And I always got a kick out of his advice to us younger folks, take your time, ponder, took him 25 minutes. And I'll tell you, nobody enjoyed his retirement more than Robbie. I sat around a lot of campfires with him and enjoyed him immensely. So with Dave's help at, at the start there, I developed a project proposal for burning in lodgepole pine slash at the Kananaskis. Now this was some place to start. You know, it went downhill from there because we kept moving north with our experimental burning program. But here at the Kananaskis, an hour from Calgary with all the amenities and there were great cooperation, really good uh, client support there from the local Alberta Forest Service people who provided uh, like the standby crews and the crews for uh, pumps and hoses uh, while, while we were burning, particularly at those high and extreme danger levels. And then the real perk was Walt Disney had a great uh, crew up there. There was California girls that played volleyball and we I don't think we missed a night up there going up to play volleyball. So like I said, it went downhill from them from there on. Uh, the Canon asked us quite unique in that that was a federal land base. We had all license to do what we wanted, but we certainly needed the cooperation of the province here. But we, we had to commercially log 40 acres there um, in the valley. And, and there was a lot of preparatory work and then work up contracts with, with the local uh, suppression folks. And it was logged by, uh, by a crew, a logging crew from the Morley Reserve. Uh, for all of the burning for the 1969 through to the 1971 burning areas. And then we laid out the plots and in sequence, what well, the strategy was to burn uh, downwind with low moderate hazards so that we kept increasing the buffer there against the standing timber until we got back to where we were gonna do extreme and, and high the burns, high hazard burns. We did hit a streak of luck in 69, started drying out in July, and we went all the way through to the middle of August, didn't miss a beat, uh, just beautiful uh, progressive drying. And, and it, it obviously really helped in uh, getting up to that extreme category. Now, we, we did have one uh, exciting day there. Uh, the, the research crew, I think, was uh, Chuck Ogilvie, Reevy Laskowski, myself, and Stan Lux, and we were down there early in the morning and a spot had come up on the opposite side and started the candle. We had this old Paramount pump, of Kananaskis uh, style pump, and it had a spark arrestor. And to start that thing, you had to be just absolutely perfect setting that spark arrestor. Anyway, when this spot fire started, we sent Stan over to start that damn pump and we're expecting all kinds of problems, but he set that just on the fly and, and pulled and it started. And but spot fire didn't have a chance, but I still think I owe Stan a case of beer from way back yeah. there. Started that day. <coughs> well, the, the convection columns, these were photographed from the tower person up, up, up above us there. And uh, you could see that smoke from Calgary. And when I think back, you know, uh, there yeah, was uh, the you know, pretty close pretty close to Calgary for that kind of risky adventure. And you could see that uh, coming drifting over the mountains any day that we that we burned uh, over the moderate hazard. Okay. Well, well, once we completed uh, that work, I had joined the National Danger Rating Working Group 
along with two of my colleagues, long, lifeline co colleagues really, it was Bruce Lawson from the Pacific Center and Brian Stocks from Great Lakes Center. And we, uh, you know, we, you know, 50 years later, we're, st we're still uh, talking to each other and, and we worked uh, on, on many projects together. But this danger rating group uh, was instrumental in beginning to link the fire weather index system to fire behavior and individual fuel types. And so from the slash type in the Kananaskis, then uh, I moved up along with George Crosswich to do uh, spring burnings in Aspen stands. And George was working across the road in the Jack Pine uh, stands. And uh, Dave had negotiated this uh, through high management levels. And we did again, get a lot of cooperation from, from the clients, from the local uh, fire, fire operations folks. I always laughed at George uh, there. He, he just couldn't uh, get going into the uh, higher hazards and he was burning uh, on, on low hazard weather for, for a number of, uh, uh, of, his, of his early burns. And he introduced this new fire spread index, centimeters per afternoon. That's, uh, Murray will talk a little bit about measuring spread rate is just uh, agonizing waiting for this fire to finally get through. So that was George's uh, new invention. He did get some great weather, and then from there on, we could drop the CPA index there, never to appear again, I guess. So that's a layout for the um, burns at Slave Lake, and uh, we got all of those done in 1972, and came back in 78 to help George and, and decided to reburn the, 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 those plots 3A, B, and C, because there was a lot of mortality. It was a different fuel type. A lot of that uh, aspen was on the ground and it turned out that uh, there was a much higher intensity burn and it's the forerunner of what was going to happen to that aspen as it aged. It changed from a D1 to something quite different and I'll talk about that as we go along here. So that's the, the collage of, of some of the typical burns as, as, as the hazards uh, were, were uh, were incorporated into, into the plot design. Uh, and as I said, we had pretty good luck again, um, getting all, all through that project uh, in, in, in 1972 in a good stretch of weather. Uh, and at one point uh, we were all looking down, there's a picture of us all looking at Ray Pondo's uh, recorder for thermocouples and we're all heads down. Everybody looks, if you look at that picture, it looks like, boy, all these researchers are, couldn't get enough for Ray's numbers. He actually had a transistor radio there. We were listening to the Canada-Russia hockey game before we lit up on that day. And uh, it was a good day for Canada because Paul Henderson scored the famous goal and we went on to have a good burn that day. That picture is deceiving, just to tell you uh, what was going on there, if you ever see that picture. Now, we were close by uh, the famous Vega fire, 1968. And Dave and Joe Griegel did a great report on that in documenting the uh, fire behavior. That fire ran 65 kilometers in 10 hours. It was unbelievable. The spread rate, a, a precedent fire in all aspects. So uh, their, their uh, report titled fire, uh, let's see, what was the forest fire conflagrations in central Alberta. Uh, a long-standing uh, record uh, spread rate in, in the literature right here in Alberta. And then Marty Alexander uh, did an analysis on the Canadian Fire Weather Index for the 68 burn, uh, just to uh, link it to uh, the Fire Weather Index numbers. Now, along came in, in 2001, uh, the Chisholm Fire. And that Chisholm Fire burned over uh, my plots and George Krasowicz's plots. So there was another reburn. So now we had 72 burn, 78 burn, and now 2001 burn. And, and you know, the fire gods must have been angry at Slave Lake because look at the fires running there historically. And then finally, 2011, uh, the flat top fire ran into Slave Lake. And you've probably all heard of the results there. I think 55 homes burned and just a catastrophic fire event. But the, the point of, of, of just bringing this up and looking at the intensities here, the Vega fire was, you know, the, if you're looking at numbers, is, is 137,000 kilowatts. Our CFS plots 15 to 390, and then the reburn 4,000. 
and change and then the CFS reburn of our plots, 27,000 kilometers per kilowatts per meter, and then the 2001 Chisholm fire uh, it's the record there, 158,000. Now, uh, the, the point about, you know, all, all this Aspen and aging forest and increasing fire intensities and maybe even climate change here is uh, we're wondering where these, where do these numbers end? Uh, we know where, you know, some of our early research benchmarked them, but it's, it's interesting. It'd be interesting to see how uh, after looking at BC conditions this year, just where this uh, where this world's going in in, in terms of uh, of increasing intensity of wildfires. So that it, this Chisholm fire was well documented. Bruce Lawson came over. Murray worked on this, remeasured our plots, and put out a nice little report on on the older aspen burning and the increase in in intensities. And the question that Bruce posed was these Aspen stands are, are they a fuel break, which in my day way in the back, they were barriers to fire if it was, um, you know, in the summer, green, very, very little um, as, uh, surface fuels, or are they fuel? And, and, and that's in this Chisholm fire, there's a tremendous amount of that Aspen and mixed wood that burned. Uh, and obviously the old D1 type uh, is not a benchmark for this old older Aspen. Now, the jack pine uh, stands, uh, we ended up moving farther north, I think just because of the risk, you know, of, of these high and extreme uh, experimental burns going, going uh, down the road, so to speak. Uh, but the logistics of getting up north and coming in through Fort Smith or Fort Chip by float plane uh, was uh, something else again. And there was a, a lot of cooperation again across the country. This was a national project and supported uh, uh, by uh, other labs and by the Fire Research Institute. And uh, what we did have, I thought it worth mentioning, we had two of the AES meteorologists on site. We worked in two week shifts over the whole summer. Fred Burbage uh, was there for every burn. We called him at the end of the day, fair weather Fred and Ben Jantz, my good friend from the province there uh, later in the years. Ben Jans was forever known as Jink Jans. He never did see a flame <laughs> on his whole summer up there just because of the rotation. This is a poster that uh, Marty put out uh, and, and Billy Grote, uh, and, and it just validates this strong relationship uh, with fire behavior and the FWI calculations if the weather is taken right on site. And we did again in, in, in uh, in Darwin Lake, uh, you wait and wait and wait for that good day to get up to the extreme. We finally got it in plot six and, 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 and the rest is, uh, is history. Now, Marty Alexander uh, talked earlier, another presentation earlier here on his uh, studies in Big Fish Lake and, and Fort Providence, which followed the same model as this cooperative project in, in Darwin Lake. So that team had CFS, uh, AFS, AES, which is Atmospheric Environment Service, NWT with Buffalo Park, motley looking crew, but boy, there's a lot of science in there, a lot of operational expertise and quite a long summer up there. We get to be a, a, a very, uh, well, we got, we got to be a kind of a relaxed group. What are you gonna do up there? I mean, you only get so many days to burn and you got a lot of time to go measure things. And a lot of the folks were, prospectors uh, the, on the Indian crew there and would be gone in those long days there out. To, uh, we don't know where they were gone there, but they'd show up for breakfast in the morning. Uh, they never did find anything that I knew of, but that was life on Darwin Lake. Okay, as we get into uh, the fire suppression project, Bob will be talking about this in spades, but the clients were asking, particularly Alberta, asking for, you know, operational uh, information and data on production rates and the trying to get into some kind of initial attack, a man up um, guidelines and, and, and they asked for some um, models and, and, and also some, some advice. And so we had meetings with the clients, uh, brainstorm meetings and, and started to get right into operations, uh, doing some uh, modeling uh, with uh, some of the data that we were gathering on wildfires and, and prescribed burns. So 
on the initial attack production rates. We got all our uh, bulldozer rates off of wildfires. We could follow the lines camped with them. Uh, but on hand lines, uh, because of, of the uh, safety issues there, we eventually abandoned that and went to uh, uh, simulated initial attack conditions, fuel type by fuel type. But one thing I think it did, and Bob will probably mention this and agree, that the operational provincial staff, you know, were really on board when we showed up on wildfires, you know, with our boots on and, and ready to go out on those fires. I think it de developed our relationship, which was good anyway, and I think that really, really helped. Now this aerial ignition, um, I, I just think uh, this is quite unique in that down in the basement, Peter Bohuniak built this uh, incendiary priming and release mechanism after the Australians had developed uh, a, pr a prototype back, back in the 60s. And, and the, the Yukon had asked uh, for uh, some help in, in, in lighting back fires. Uh, in that large area up there with the no road access and everything and so this this thing was was built tested in the Yukon Gary flew it in the Yukon I flew it up in the territories along with Pete Murphy and and, and it 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 worked well out of, out of helicopters um, uh, but John Marrero went one step farther invented this flying drip torch and I spent 10 years uh, flying that in operationally in in Alberta and, and this took it up a notch because as you see, you've got instant fire. The other one with the potassium permanganate took time uh, to uh, percolate and then to finally build up a fire line and you had to double ignite and so on. But this flying drip torch uh, got to be some, something commercially built and it just went uh, ballistic. It's uh, incorporated into most agencies uh, command team uh, planning and operations and there are specialists highly trained specialists now that are involved in this and so i this is vernon this summer so i i, I just can't help but to relate back to the basement where peter's playing around building this thing and then we get to uh, to try it out and here you are now with that's an operation there that i think john Marrero would have admired uh, what came from the uh, the drip torch side here. So th this is a big scale, big operations. And you know, there's a lot on the line. There's communities downwind here that are in big trouble and this indirect attack does have its place. But I, I think the, the credit going back to the Northern era was probably not recognized un until, uh, uh, you know, some of these, um, oh, well, some of these fires now are uh, beyond uh, direct attack and it's indirect attack that's uh, sa saving the day. So my final comment is uh, I, did, I didn't abandon uh, Peter. I transferred over to the Forest Service and I really had got into the operational side and, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I enjoyed uh, where, what I was doing but uh, ended up it was a good, good career move and, and I after I finished in the Alberta Forest Service in 2001 there, I started uh, consulting to 2020. A lot of that with uh, Bruce Lawson and uh, with Brian Stocks. But uh, I must say that the early experience with uh, CFS was a foundation for, uh, well, it was over 50 years by the time I got done here. And, and so I was really pleased to participate in your anniversary uh, session here and uh, looking forward to Bob and Murray's presentation. Ready to go? Over to Happy Bob. Okay, thanks. Uh, well done, Dennis. I, I wish I had the campfire uh, storytelling skills that you exhibited. I'm uh, going to probably read most of what I have here in the way of material. So uh, picking up on that, I uh, transferred down to Northern from the Yukon Forest Service in uh, September of 1972, uh, wherein I replaced research officer Joe Griegel, who had recently taken a uh, position with Monsanto Canada. Grevy Laskowski was the designated research technician assigned to support my position as a fire research officer. 
with study responsibilities focusing on aerial fire attack systems, fire retardant mixing systems and delivery performance, as well as helicopter assisted fire control operations. During my first year or so on the job, the learning curve was steep and challenging. With Revy's assistance and the guidance of my predecessor, Joe Griegel, I slowly became conversant in the makeup and combustion inhibiting characteristics of the primary diammonium phosphate and ammonium sulfate long-term retardants. These were fertilizer-based uh, commodities on the market at the time. After developing a working relationship with my counterparts with the USDA Forest Service Fire Research Station in uh, Mon Missoula, Montana, I began to feel somewhat comfortable in my new field of research. Then came the need to understand the many different facets of the aerial delivery, otherwise known as tank and gating systems operating in Western Canada and eventually across Canada was the next challenge. Similarly, there were a host of helicopter buckets being used at that time in fire control operations. So from there, a primary field of inquiry at this time called for assessing air tanker and retardant drop patterns in an effort to determine individual air tanker drop performance characteristics and fire line building capacity. This undertaking eventually led to a wide variety of summer drop tests and evaluations. Collectively, we investigated delivery systems associated with the TBM Avenger, the Mitchell B-26, the Douglas DC-6, and the PBY-5A Cancel, and a couple of the helicopter buckets employed at that time as well. Most drop tests were conducted with long-term retardants, known at the time as FOSCheck and Pyrotrol, but also included some with water or water thickeners, and also, uh, oh, these, uh, which were known as short-term retardants. Most drop tests were conducted in open fields using a sampling grid of disposable cups held in reusable containers. A few were conducted below a forest canopy to assess crown interception. These investigations culminated in the publication of an information report, NORAX 273, titled Air Tanker and Fire Retardant Drop Patterns, published in 1985. Moving along, when we were not conducting uh, drop tests, Laskowski and I spent a lot of time monitoring and instructing users in the importance of retardant quality control measurement and consistency. Chemical fire retardants have always been and continue to be very costly commodities, calling for ongoing attention to their efficacy. Accordingly, we spent a great deal of time at the many air tanker bases we visited across Western and Northern Canada. <clears throat> So then uh, in 1980, I'd completed my uh, master's at the U of A, where I developed a location allocation model designed to optimize the prepositioning of air tanker groups in consideration of changing and emerging forest fire hazard predictions. Several related publications along this subject line were produced over time. I've always advocated that fixed wing fire bombers can and should play a critical role in the initial attack on wildfires. To these ends, we spent the better part of two summers assessing initial air tanker attacks on emergent wildfires. These evaluations and concomitant recommendations were published in the 1983 Forestry Report number 23. Another area of interest to me had to do with the ability of initial attack fire bombers to accurately and effectively place their costly retardant loads for maximal effectiveness during first strikes on newly discovered fires. This project proved to be somewhat embarrassing to participating tanker pilots who eventually bent the rules of engagement by descending to treetop level to destroy our smoke generating assembly when they continuously missed the target at prescribed drop altitudes. We published these findings in the 1975 forestry report number four brackets four. Moving along, then somewhat by accident in 1977, we discovered that water hardness characteristics of many of the lakes across the Great Plains region adversely affected the viscosity of the water thickening agent tenogum as it was being injected into the tanks of water skimming cancel water bombers. Through a combination of lab and field trials, we were able to demonstrate to the fire control agencies in Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta that continued use of this water thickening agent in areas where water hardness was likely to be in the high to very high 
range would not prove to be cost effective. These results were reported in the 1981 Forest Management Note Number Nine. So from there, during most of my fire research time, helicopter buckets were fabricated with rigid or semi-rigid materials, making it difficult for pilots to stow their buckets for transport between fire operations. Through my association with Okanagan Helicopters, I was approached by an underwater lifting balloon company, SCI Industries of Richmond, BC, to assist with their development of a truly collapsible bucket being developed using a segment of one of their lifting balloons. With the able assistance of hydrology research scientist Graham Hillman at NOFC, uh, Graham passed his calculus course and I did not, I was able to guide SCI Industries in their design of the flow control tube component of their proposed heli bucket, known as the Bambi bucket. As a result, my reported enthusiasm for the portability and performance features of this radically new bucket eventually brought their finished product to the attention of fire control agencies and helicopter operators around the world. I believe this bucket has become the standard across the industry today. I think I could liken that unto the uh, Marrero uh, uh, drip torch, flying drip torch that Dennis reported to. Some of our work uh, at the time eventually made it to a world scale of acceptance. We're pretty proud of that, I say. On a somewhat similar front, I was approached by Treasury Board of Canada to assist one of their analysts with a feasibility study having to do with the Government of Canada's support for a national air tanker fleet of Canada Air CL215 water bombers. Through a comparison of fire line building capabilities of the various land-based bombers in use at the time and those of the CL215 water bomber, I was using a relatively crude performance model to demonstrate that to uh, to demonstrate that the short turn turnaround water delivery capabilities of the CL215 outperformed the retardant delivery capabilities of longer turnaround land-based bombers in a sustained fire suppression mode. Early in the 1980s, most Canadian provinces opted into the resultant National Air Tanker Program, where each CL215 purchased by a province was matched with the Government of Canada counterpart. So finally, although I've penned a few personal highlights from my time with the Northern Forestry Center group, fire group, I by no means acted alone. Collectively, we were a close-knit and collaborative bunch, to say the least. In the same way in which I relied on others to assist with field trials, such as retardant drop tests, I assisted my co-investigators in field activities whenever called upon. Prescribed burns, fuel loading and mapping surveys in national parks, such as Jasper and Nahani, instructional courses, training seminars, Intermountain Fire Council conferences, client agency visitations, provincial, regional, and national fire control agency meetings, and so on, regularly, regularly called for cooperative effort by our entire team. Overall, we were curiosity, and as Dennis noted, client-driven. We all moved on with a feeling of accomplishment upon concluding this segment of our careers. We had fun throughout, and I say those were the days. And that uh, will conclude my... Uh, presentation. We'll take any questions that arise uh, when Murray's through. Take it over, Murray. Murray still there? Okay, I should be here now. There you go. I guess some reason I got muted. For my presentation, uh, recollections of an EG. The EG stands for engineering, engineering and scientific support. So for the NOFC 50th anniversary session on fire, I'm going to present uh, summaries of four projects I was involved with from 1970 to 1976. And that spans my time at the Forest Fire Research Institute with Ed Satishan and Ed Little and my time at Northern Forestry Center with Dennis Quintilio and Marty Alexander. The summaries will be on fireline explosives, rate of spread timers, in-stand wind speed measurements, and fireline sprinkler systems. 
Fireline Explosives. In the early 70s at Petawawa, I was uh, an observer and helper um, from uh, the Forest Fire Research Institute and an experiment using detonation cord, which is uh, used by the military. But this was specialized. It was wrapped in a plastic casing with fire retardant. So when it went off, it didn't uh, set fires. And the debt cord was used explosively to try and excavate a shallow trench, blowing everything clear of mineral soil to create a fire line. And we could also use it for uh, blowing a hole in a swamp into which in, to insert a fire pump and it could be used to fell trees. And that was quite a fun day. As uh, at a later date, I observed a, a video done by the Alaska Forest Service where they stretched out several miles of depth cord and put it off. And it was uh, quite a fast video because depth cord propagates at about 15,000 feet per second. And then I uh, moved to Forest Fire Re or to Northern Forestry Center, and my second experience was an, as an observer and helper, occurring in the early '80s. I was invited to observe and help on an AFS experiment in the White Court uh, area. They were experimenting with a project called Geoline, which was used in the oil industry, and it was a slurry contained in a plastic tube. And you had lengths of a three quarter inch diameter, 125 feet long, one and a quarter inch diameter, 75 feet long. And these could be connected by taping the tubes together to extend the line. They uh, hoped to use it for, again, excavating a um, shallow trench uh, free, of, free to mineral soil, but they found they had to actually excavate a shallow trench and lay the line in it to get it to uh, move the debris down to mineral soil. Otherwise, it would only flatten the grass and uh, remove a lot of leaves from the vegetation. And again, it, was, it could be used for digging a hole in a swamp for pumps and to fell trees uh, that you wanted away from the fire line. As it turned out, though, uh, fireline explosives never uh, really caught on due to the cost of the product. It was only suitable for certain terrain. Transportation and storage regulations were complex. Certified personnel had to be available to safely use it, and it only had a five year shelf life. So, fireline explosives were a good idea, but basically didn't um, pan out the way they'd hoped. Second project was rate of spread timers. In the late 60s, early 70s, El Samard, a researcher in Ottawa, developed the rate of spread timer. The device consisted of a AA battery wired to electronic components to a clock. And there was two wires affixed that uh, protruded above it. The um, device was contained in a small medicine vial for protection. The wires protruded through about two inches above the top. These rate of spread timers were um, inserted into the soil in a prescribed burn in a grid system, varied uh, two by two meters, five by five meters. And the two wires protruding had two alligator clips attached to them, to which a, a piece of solder was clipped uh, prior to the burn being ignited. So once the burn uh, was ignited, the fire burned through the plot and melted the solder, activating the clock. Thus, uh, your post burn uh, action was to dig up the timers and the time on the clock was referenced to a base clock, which was started at the time of ignition. And by referencing this time, a time difference, 
you could plot the fire advance through the plot and also measure uh, using uh, the 50 meter, five meter interval, the time it took to burn through the plot and that could be expressed in feet per second, meter per second, uh, even up to miles per hour, meters per hour. And they, they worked quite well. The only problem being these early ones were all wired together and uh, spring maintenance was always a fun time trying to make sure all the wires were connected and they would be useful. So in the, thus in the early eighties, I worked with a, another EG at uh, NOFC, Rick Hurdle, who was versed in electronics. And he basically designed the rate of spread timer to fit onto a circuit board, which would be called a, a solid, tape, solid state rate of spread timer. And the two protruding wires were attached to the top of the circuit board and all was housed in a medicine vial as before. So this improved the reliability of the timers and made spring, spring maintenance uh, quite easy. I'll now go on to in-stand wind speed measurements. That was always fun. In the early days, to get an average wind speed in a tree stand required setting up an anemometer on a stand one meter above the forest floor and having a person sit by it and record the readings every 10 minutes or uh, whatever inter interval you wanted over a period of time, often worked out to five or six hours a day. And this often occurred on rainy days because that's when we had the time available. So you'd sit there in your rain suit and bugs and write down numbers. The, the anemometer to use was called a totalizing anemometer. And once the period of time was over, the numbers were totaled and reference to the time interval and an average wind speed could be calculated in uh, whatever parameters you desired, feet per second, meters per second. Side note, I was involved with another uh, EG, Dick Smith, and the researcher George Krosowitz, and we were at his plots in Slave Lake, Alberta, uh, not too far from Slave Lake, and across from the Aspen plots that Dennis mentioned. And we were up there for four days, sitting out in the uh, sun and the bugs, an average of eight hours a day, recording numbers every 10 minutes. And at least this was done in clear weather, but we had to be prepared for the bugs. Then came the 80s, the electronic and computer age. Our first setup, uh, Rick Hurdle produced a converter to convert the anemometer signals to a pulse that could be um, recorded on a device. And you could download the wind speed again in whatever interval you wanted, one minute, 10 minutes, an hour, at a speed of in possibly meters per second, meters per hour. And you didn't have to sit there and uh, for five hours recording, you could do it every day. You could do it uh, yeah, after a while, once a month. And um, where am I here? Another setup uh, was uh, used at our big fish burn in out of high level, uh, Alberta. The weather stations were set up and hooked to uh, radio telemetry gear at the site. So I could uh, use a computer and landline to ask the computer in high level to contact the weather stations. They would uh, dump their information to the high level computer and then it would come down the landline and I could get the daily weather. So we saved quite a bit of money by not being up there during rainy days. We could sit in Edmonton, pick out a, a nice day uh, window for a burn and head up. But uh, that wasn't always true. We had one session that uh, Marty, Rob McAlpine and a couple of others, we drove up Thursday 
rained Friday, drove home Saturday. And that was, so again, it was much better than sitting in the rain and the bugs. And the last um, project that I found quite interesting was Fireline Sprinkler Systems. The con uh, concept of Fireline Sprinklers has been around for years. And uh, Dennis used them in 1969 at Kananaskis. And I believe uh, Forestry Canada worked with various provincial fire agencies on uh, system development. The systems were set up to create a fire line and you didn't need as many personnel to set them up or monitor them. You just let them sit there and wet down the area. They could also be used to circle a building and land to wet it down to prevent the fire from coming in. And some were even um, set up to be affixed to the buildings. Um, challenges were with these systems. How many sprinklers could be run from a single fire pump? What was the optimum distance between sprinklers for overlap? The uh, best way to keep the sprinklers upright and the type of sprinkler used. One example was a small bronze sprinkler head called a rainbird. It could wet down a 360 degree circle or be adjusted to whatever arc was applicable. The sprinkler head oscillated in the water stream to swing the sprinkler back and forth through the selected arc. I was involved as an observer and helper from NOFC on an AFS experiment to help refine the sprinkler systems in the early 80s. Observations were spacing the sprinklers at 50 foot intervals provided good overlap. And as an example, a Wayjax Mark III fire pump would uh, support approximately a string of approximately 25 sprinklers at 50 foot intervals. Other pumps uh, had different parameters depending on the size. Uh, note the AFS sprinklers were mounted on a one foot long, <clears throat> one and one half inch diameter brass pipe with hose connectors on both ends and a six to eight inch spike welded on the bottom to hold them in the ground. Uh, the one problem with these uh, particular sprinklers was, depending on the terrain, if you inserted them into the ground, it was soft, they could fall over. And sometimes when the fire pump was charging the hose, it could cause a bit of a bump and flip the sprinklers out of the ground. Uh, so we at NOFC assembled a sprinkler package similar to the AFS, except on the bottom of the pipe, we mounted a, an eight inch uh, long, one inch uh, wide piece of brass, uh, brass bar. And at the each end was a hole drilled in the end into which you could insert a spike to help hold it in the ground. And these were a bit more stable. And we used, we made up a couple of packages of these to use on our prescribed burns. Although it was found at one time on George's pine plots, we used the sprinkler system and the microclimate relative humidity actually affected the burning. It was uh, quite an interesting find. And that's basically concludes my presentation, but in conclusion, uh, this presentation gives an idea of the different concepts developed through fire research to aid in collecting research data and developing practical aids for firefighting. Thank you. Thanks, Murray, and thanks to Dennis and Bob as well. Um, that was great. and. Uh, and I uh, sure appreciate all your comments. I have to say that the uh, fire group certainly does uh, very different work now, not necessarily better or more exciting. 
I <laughs> um, also want to um, thank um, uh, Shara again, also Ron, who is the head honcho of this whole uh, seminar series. And I also want to mention that uh, Kathy uh, arranged for me to have access to the uh, NOFC archives and slide collection where some of these uh, slides came from. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Ron. Thanks, Peter. Uh, actually, this is an opportunity if anybody's got questions for the uh, speakers, this would be the ideal time to do so. Pretty quiet. Nobody has any questions for our, our esteemed retirees. Ron, just uh, to point out what Cher has posted there, the acknowledgments recognize uh, briefly the nature of the research conducted by uh, our cohorts at the time that are no longer with us. Uh, George and Joe and Chuck and Joe and Ron and Dennis and George are all gone. Uh, otherwise, they would have been uh, with us here today. So uh, in acknowledgement of their work, uh, we post that file that, that Dennis and Leanne put together. Duly noted, uh, and I know a couple of these people and so it's certainly one of the realities people will pass on, but they, they would have been, it would have been outstanding if these people were still with us to have contributed to today's yeah. presentation. Well, it was 50 years ago. <laughs> Ron, just it's Kelvin Hirsch here. Hi, Kelvin. Hi, Bob and Dennis and Murray. Just uh, wanted to say thanks to you guys for taking time to uh, put those uh, memories together and uh, kind of really appreciated the context and history around all of that sort of stuff. So uh, thanks very much for doing that. Even after all that time you spent cleaning my drop grid? Yeah, well, I. If I have a moment, I can tell the story. Uh, when I was first hired, uh, the first two weeks uh, had this very important scientific job to do for Bob. And he was talking about how the uh, drop patterns were done in cups and the cups had to fit in the metal cans and the cans had to have a certain uh, rim on them. So one on summer student put the lid on and one summer student took the lid off. And we did that for two weeks. <laughs> wondered what the heck is this all about so anyway fortunately got to be able to go with uh with uh, marty and others up to uh porter lake later on in the summer and see actual fires and things going on but uh yeah yeah appreciated you getting me introduced to all of that bob there you go it paid off <laughs> perseverance stubbornness an ability to solve tight problems. Exactly. And a note for Dennis, uh, I saw a question mark on the slide of the uh, fire danger team, Dennis. You had a question mark where I believe you will find uh, Johnny Walker. Check no, we had, yeah, no, we had Johnny Walker. This is a guy from uh, Nova Scotia that was on that group and we cannot track his name down, yeah. Okay, I missed that. So. Yeah, we did have Johnny Walker labeled there. Yeah. Okay. Lots of Johnny Walker stories, too. <laughs> Not the kind in the bottle, either. No. no. I, I can remember working with uh, Ed Statistician and uh, Johnny Walker and Brian Stocks up in uh, northern Ontario, and those two were known as Stocker and Walker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got the uh, mic. I'd like to acknowledge too that Ross Waldron was the first uh, to provide a uh, copy of that Gary Still portrait, uh, the um, caricature of the fire team back in 1973. Ross was able to, uh, I think, obtain it from Bruce. Uh, um, uh, yeah, okay. And uh, would, and, and I was able to scan it into the uh, into Shara's hands there. So Ross, thanks for that.
Are there any other uh, comments, questions from anybody? I would just like to thank the presenters um, as one of the current directors. This is fantastic history um, and context, and I get a lot out of these sessions. So thanks so much for the time you put into your presentations. Welcome. Thank you, Matthew. I see Dave Keel was joined had joined us. Is uh, Dave going to contribute anything? No, he's off. No, he's still there. He's on mute, yeah. Dave, you want to unmute yourself? Uh, I guess not. Yep. He's there talking, but he. Dave, you're muted. Lower left hand corner, uh, Dave. Can't do it from here. Eh? No. Well, they're okay. picking up on Dave there. Thanks once again to Shara for helping us. Uh, if you relied on me, we'd still uh, be in the bush someplace. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Well, you've done your thank you for me then. All right. Well, thanks, Peter. And uh, Again, to Dennis, Bob, and Murray for your contributions, stories, and Dave uh, is off mute now. Ron, oh, Dave is off mute. Dave, Can you hear me something? now? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed the presentations, Bob, Dennis, and Murray, and others. Uh, brings back some memories, but uh, as I said in a previous email, uh, my uh, memory is uh, kind of shot, so I couldn't really uh, add anything to it, but. Fire research was always an important part of the Northern Forest Center activity. And uh, I think we had a good working relationship with the uh, provincial governments in the region and others. And uh, so it was good to be brought up to date on some of the more major activities that the fire researchers uh, participated in. And uh, it, it enjoyed it very much. So thanks for arranging the uh, 50th anniversary uh, reunion. Okay, thanks, Dave. Thank okay. you again to all the speakers and uh, share in particular for helping you, the dad and Bob, and to put this thing together. Uh, I guess we know mm -hmm. tomorrow. Uh, originally, this this seminar was scheduled for tomorrow. Tomorrow was a work day, oh. but then mm -hmm. uh, you know the new um, acknowledgement uh, for National Day for Truth and Reconciliation came in, and so we moved it over a day mm -hmm. earlier in uh, recognition of that. And so, mm -hmm. thank you for all of those who were able to participate. And uh, a video is being captured of this event. Uh, when I have a chance, I'll be publishing up to YouTube and producing mm -hmm. off a link and making it available. Until then, uh, I bid you all a good afternoon and may you all uh, keep safe and keep well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Ron and Peter, for helping uh, us go visual. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. Right on, Peter. Shutting down here. Thank you.